Hey everybody, this is Rob DeLuca from Spread Eagle, UFO, and Sebastian Bach, and you're listening to GlamMetal.com. Welcome to the Glam Metal Interview Series, presented by RockMusicStar.com, with host Thomas S. Walt Jr. Hey Glam Metal Heads, it's Thomas from Rock Music Star with episode number 9 of the Glam Metal Interview Series. It is September 15th, 2020, and I have Rob DeLuca, bass player, songwriter of Spread Eagle, UFO, and Sebastian Bach Band as my special guest. Rob gives us a great interview, and if you're a fan of Spread Eagle and UFO, you will really enjoy our chat. So here he is, Rob DeLuca. I'm on the phone with our special guest, Rob DeLuca, bass player, songwriter from Spread Eagle, UFO, and the Sebastian Bach Band. Rob, thank you for joining us today, and how are you doing? I'm doing great, Tom. It's really good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Uh, you have a, a lot going on uh, where, where some artists are uh, just hibernating during this time. Um, you are um, recording a new Spread Eagle record as we speak, correct? Well, somewhat correct. We're we're in the process of writing it, and as we write it, we demo things. So we're uh, we're ha- we, we're in in sessions working on the record. Yeah, and it's coming out great. It really is. I'm very excited. Was that the game plan before the lockdown to start writing another record so soon after Subway to the Stars? Well, I mean, we probably would have gotten around to writing around now. Uh, without thinking about it, you know, without really knowing what we would have done, without being able to predict the future. But uh, we had a, a bunch of tour dates booked in April, May, and June. And, of course, we would have been looking for more tour dates, but we probably would have been itching to start putting together some new music. Um, but now it's, you know, it's the only thing we can do. So, Yeah, that must have been a real bummer to lose those tour dates, right, with, you know, with everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. That yeah, sucks. It, was, it really sucked, but it happened to a lot of bands. But, uh, you know, it was our big comeback tour, you know, and yeah, we were yeah, doing sure. Canada and America, and we we're talking about uh, talking to promoters in Europe. So, yeah, it was really disappointing. But, we, you know, um, we'll rise above it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, did you think of doing any of those, like, unorthodox type of uh, concert uh facilities like the drive-in theaters or anything you know crazy like that i haven't um i'm not saying i wouldn't do it but there's something about it that's not that rock and roll to me so you know if if it's uh, i would hope to just wait it out and hopefully things will change in a you know in a relatively in the relative near future um instead of having to rethink what a concert is to me you know what i mean after all these years of of touring you know like i i have set feelings about what live shows are and and what's awesome about them so i'd have to really rethink everything and i know some bands are doing that and and power to them and that's the way they survive you know but uh i'm not ready to go there yet yeah. Do you think if this thing like uh, you know lasts for like another year, do you think you will release an, another uh, Spread Eagle record during this time? Um, or do you, yeah, I'm 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 not afraid to release it when we can't tour. Um Because yeah. I mean, they, those things are related, but they don't have to be. You know, we're going to tour as soon as as soon as we can. Um, and we have you know we have three albums released now, so we can basically split the setup into you know, a third of each album and play a a really strong set that our fans will love. So, uh, you know, when let's say that we release a record before it's, you know, touring is safe, you know, then we'll just have four records to choose from when we eventually tour that album, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to keep putting out music and, and, and keep recording and, and uh, tours whenever we can, as much as we can. Yeah, your uh, last release um, you did with uh, Spread Eagle, Subway to the Stars, that was an incredible re- release. You must have been really pleased with the way that came out and the reception that it got from uh, you know a lot of hard rock fans and your your longtime fans as well. Yeah, I, I am really proud of it and really 
uh, just delighted with, with the way the press reacted to it. Uh, even our first album didn't get a whole lot of press, even though it was, it was usually good press. And uh, Subway with the Stars, it, it just really generated a lot of press. I think a lot of people were surprised um, that, you know, that we weren't just dialing it in, you know. And, and I think some people may expect a band that hasn't made a record together in, in 25 years to just kind of like put something out that's, you know, whatever. And we that wasn't. That wasn't our plan at all. That was never part of the plan. We had to make a really strong record that was had a lot of a lot of interesting parts and a lot of cool riffing and a lot of different moods that worked within our genre and not tr- songs that didn't repeat ourselves, you know. And that's you know that's that's a big that's a tall order. And um, I'm just delighted that that people basically felt the amount of energy we put into it, you know, because we, we were, we, we, we didn't want, we wanted every song to count on that album. Every single song was just as important. Like we knew, I figured from very early on that, that sound of speed would be the single, but that didn't get any more attention than any other song. Like even the real deep cuts, um, got just as much attention. Some of them actually got a little more because, because, some songs are a little, sometimes are a little problematic and you have to spend more time on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sound of Speed, I mean, that was a scorcher. I mean, the, God, man, if, if that song doesn't pump you up, then you're dead. The song is incredible. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's just, you know, no, nothing, there's nothing better than hard rock riffing, you know? It's, it's just, you can't go wrong with riffing, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. we love that one. Was was that um? Did you feel like you had a lot of pressure? A lot you had to really prove yourself coming back after such a long time with that record. I mean, like I said, was there kind of like pressure just to make it like as perfect as possible? Well, I always put a lot of pressure on myself, you know. So it, 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 you know, I've written a lot of stuff in between the the Spread Eagle records. So it's not like all of a sudden I'm going back to something that was very murky and years in my past, you know? So, I mean, I've been writing hard rock my whole life. So I just kind of just set out to do what I do. And, 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 um, just make it the best we can. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess there's always going to be some pressure, but it's no more pressure than I put on myself for anything else. Yeah. Yeah, now now this year was also the 30 year anniversary of your debut records, uh, Spread Eagle. Um, what what a great record that was! I mean, I just you know started. I I bought it when it first came out, and then you know over the years kind of forgot about it, and then just recently put it on again. And wow, what an amazing record that is! Yeah, it's it's a powerful statement, definitely. And you know, we we lived that record, and uh, and. It, it stands the test of time. We got up to Buffalo a couple times on that album mm-hmm. and maybe even on the next album also. Yeah. Yeah. I love it though. I still love it. Yeah. Now, now the interesting thing about spread Eagle is that you guys were signed before you even played a gig. Is that correct? That's a hundred percent true. We like the stories online about us, you know, a lot of bands have stories that, that are fabricated or just playing uh, on, untru- you know, wrong. Um, but the stories online about us are, are really pretty much a hundred percent true. We, uh, we, we came to New York. We got, we, we got Ray. Um, we booked some gigs outside the city. We didn't want to play in the city yet. And, um, we had two managers. One was a video guy. One was a guy who was in the industry a little bit. And, um, their names were Scott Calvert and Charlie Gambetta and Charlie knew some people in the industry. So we were rehearsing for these first gigs and, uh, he started asking people to come down, just kind of give us some hard criticism to kind of fast track us, fast track us to get, you know, as pro as, as we could. And, uh, we started getting offers right away <laughs> and these were the rehearsals for the first gigs. So we, we, um, we signed MCA and we, we, instead of 
we canceled the gigs and went into the studio and we only had about five songs um when we got signed so yeah and it, it's also kind of amazing that although new york city is a you know big big music mecca that a lot of the hard rock bands were getting signed in la at the time yeah there was there was you know some of that street metal street rock element here no doubt but but the scene in la was bigger and and the, all the labels you know most of the labels were had their headquarters in la so it's just where it was located it was centrally located more centrally located out there than, than on the east coast yeah now now were there other labels besides mca that were interested in uh signing the band was there like a bidding war or anything such as that um there would have been if we were more patient sony um really really wanted the band and they waited for us for years uh they waited their turn for us but we broke up right when they were right when we could have went to sony um we broke up oh wow when we when we were off of mca we finally got all out of mca and because they they they, uh, they promised us a video we had a video um in our contract for the second album they wouldn't give us a video so that was an out for us and so we got out and we had sony waiting but um you know it wasn't meant to be i i, I wish we would have done a record with sony i still think you know we had the we had the stink on us that we weren't grunge and you know people weren't as receptive to us but you know to have a, a, a strong third record would have been nice for our legacy you know and maybe that would have held us sustained us for a few years to to wait it out to wait out the grunge you know hysteria yeah but it wasn't meant to be so now i've heard i've been talking with some other artists that were on mca that i i've had i have not heard some very good things about being an artist on mca um how, how do you feel about your time on mca do you do you feel that you know, things have been done differently or if, if they, you feel like they spent enough time promoting your band? Um, you know, I, no, but I'm sure anyone who had records that didn't break feel that way about their label, I'm sure. But uh, my specific criticisms were they, they pulled us off the road too early uh, from the first album and, and uh, sent us, you know, they pulled us off the road to... to and told us to start writing the second album and i think that was uh, too soon and then they didn't they didn't promote the second album enough yeah but they put two albums out worldwide you know pretty much worldwide so uh you know that's more than a lot of bands got you know yeah now on your first record who were some of the bands that you toured with we didn't tour with a lot of bands we, we mainly went out headlining clubs with local support but we did go out um with vane i think it was like a co-headlining thing um and we went out with them but they went on last every night so i don't know if if, if i think it was even billing but i'm not sure maybe we were opening mm -hmm. um but that was a cool tour for what it lasted but it, it didn't last too long yeah that was a great bill that was a, that was a really powerful bill. I wish we would have kept it together, but bands were arguing, and we just couldn't make it work. Yeah, were, were I've, they, st I've since be become good, good friends with those guys. They're they're really nice guys. But at the time, we were everyone was just so cocky and on eleven, you know, and just full. We were we were so aggressive. <laughs> we were just so aggressive. So. I guess, I guess it was hard to, to, to be around us in some ways. Yeah, that was my next question. Do you think maybe you scare some bands uh, away from asking you to play with them because of the fact that they didn't want to get blown off the stage? I'm not sure. I mean, that, that, would, be, that would be cocky to say that, but I know <laughs> we were really, really powerful live, and I know we were getting a really strong reaction before Vame was, and that was the beginning of the problems. Um, so I don't know. But uh, you know, it, it would have been nice to do to to do some support slots back then with some big some with some big bands. But it wasn't meant to be, you know. Yeah. I, I guess that's another thing that was MCA's uh, doing or undoing. You know, they 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 could have gotten us on some tours, and that didn't happen. Yeah, like like I said before, that that first record and and your second record as well. I mean, they were just like 
uh, like sonic masterpieces i mean that that first record was super aggressive and and i i agree that it's one of the best like records from like you know that time period you know right up there with like the guns and roses records and and the skid row record I and mean, just like every song is super powerful thank you thank you so much you're welcome um i want to i want to spend a little time uh also talking about the other band that you're currently in and that's ufo um mm-hmm. you, you joined the band in 2008 when uh pete way couldn't know could no longer play with the band um how did you get involved with ufo well i was playing with sebastian and we did about a hundred shows supporting guns and roses uh so i was there for about 80 of those shows and um so we were around you know those guys a lot and um so i got to know ron thal bumblefoot and um and at one point without me knowing um Vinny Moore, who was friends with Ron Thal, uh, told him that Pete Way couldn't get in to the country because this wasn't the first time that he couldn't get in. I think it was the second or, or third time. And uh, Vinny was telling Ron that th- they needed someone who played solid and was just like a solid guy. So um, Ron recommended me, and uh, and my it helped a little bit because my brother-in-law um, knew Vinny a little bit. So Vinny knew my family just a little bit. So I think things just kind of fell into place and, uh, and they, they signed me up and I didn't have to audition or anything. They went by Ron's recommendation, which was really great. Wow. And uh, we went right into a tour. Yeah. So, so what, was, what was your mindset for your very first UFO gig? Don't make any mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fuck up the songs. <laughs> Um, I think it was just, uh, I think actually it was that, I think it was just like, try to remember all the parts, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts to their songs. There's a lot of songs and th- that people knew every note of, and, um, you know, they had, they had quite a fan base and quite a history and quite a catalog. So I just wanted to, you know, I was just, I just wanted to be a strong foundation, uh, to, reflect Pete Way's parts um, very respectfully, not just trash all over his parts, you know, just if I had a, if I played something a little different that was more my style, it would still incorporate what he, what he had done. Um, I didn't want to reinvent anything that was already great. You know, I didn't want to try to reinvent anything that was already great. So it was just um, give a solid foundation you know, mm-hmm. and that, that was basically my my mindset. And, and how do you uh, feel that the uh, fans reacted to you? Do you feel they uh, welcomed you with open arms, or were there? They any- were actually very respectful. I mean, I know that they wanted Pete back, but I think they were also hearing stories that he wasn't well. Um, you know, because going back even you know that long, there were a lot of stories that he wasn't doing as well so um i think you know that i think our, the fans gave me a really fair shot and they respected that if pete was going to come back it was going to be phil's decision and and they were just waiting to see i think they were hoping for pete to come back to be honest with you yeah. but uh they were very respectful about not getting overly aggressive about it or anything like that and because i mean the they knew that Phil knows the band and what's best for the band really, really well, you know, to keep a band going. You know, it's one thing to say, you know, I have a band and I know what's best for it and blah, blah, blah. And I've, I've had this band for five years or whatever, you know, Phil's had the band for 50 years. So, you know, at that time it was, you know, about 40 years or something. So, um, you know, fans know that his, his, his plan and his decisions are are always almost always work really well for UFO. Yeah. So they trusted that um, I was there for a reason, and and I was I was there because Pete wasn't well and he couldn't get into the country, and and then you know it just it worked out so well that I just you know they just kept me. Yeah, I I 
as a longtime UFO fan, I, I think you're a, a good fit also. Um, Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And, and watching some of those videos, I, I, I love how you add your like background vocals to those songs. And I mean, it's it's perfect. I, I don't recall before you joined, I don't re recall Pete Way doing vocals like that. Right? No, no, I don't think he sung. No, I, I don't think so either. I mean, if he did, not as much as, as you do in the set. Yeah, I mean, I take, you know, like, I, I take singing very seriously. Like, everything, every aspect of what what I do, I, I kind of look at as some type of art form. And, you know, there's the how you play and how you sing and how you dress and how you move and how you get along with people in the band, how you get along with fans. You know, it's all it's all part of the gig, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and the better you are at all those things and how you write, how you song write, and the better you are at all those things, you know, the the better, the the more successful you'll be, and the ultimately the happier you should become. Yeah, unfortunately, the UFO family has really suffered a lot of tragedy over the last like year and a few months with uh with Paul Raymond uh, passing away, then then uh Paul Chapman, and then uh, of course P. Wage is uh, very recently. Um, that that's pretty tragic stuff how are the uh guys in ufo holding up with all this i think they're pretty shocked you know like these are people that they spent so many years with um paul raymond joined the band in i think about i'm guessing around 75 or something and uh he was in and out a few times but he was in the band for many many years and paul chapman obviously did a few stints so i i I saw the band when I was a kid with Paul Chapman. Right. And, um, you know, he was there for, for a good long run. And Pete, you know, Pete, they started as kids kids together, you know. So it's it's very sobering. You know, you feel sad for the, the person who passed away. You feel sad for their family. And then you also, you know, you feel bad for yourself because you're like, wow, your life is just so short, you know. Yeah. It's 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 very sobering. Yeah, and it's it it's devastating also for fans. I mean, it really is. It's so depressing when when you when you hear that your heroes are dropping off like this. Um, yeah, and a lot of fans. Excuse me for for interrupting, but a lot of fans, uh, you know, hoped someday that there'd be some kind of memorial concerts or something where the you know guys would come back, you know, and to at least for a show or something. I heard you know there was nothing in the works, but I heard fans and press and um people in the industry you know try to convince phil of it many times um and you know i didn't ever expect that to happen because because i think phil would have was always wary that people wouldn't show up you know which which is what happened a lot of times when the band fell apart people just didn't show up yeah but um but yeah, I think a lot of fans were, you know, heartbroken that it never, you know, that it never got back together with those guys for, you know, a DVD or a single concert or a tour or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. How, what's it like working with Phil? He's easy to work with. Oh my God, he's one of the, the easiest people I've ever worked with in a band. Seriously. He's just, if you do your job great, he'll, you know, he's, he's just... Uh, smile on his face yeah so, i mean everyone has has their moments i guess but to be honest with him i've seen it l fewer than than almost anyone who's 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 hired me mm. wow I, I i'm kind of surprised to hear that i kind of <laughs> thought he would be like you know with you know a little rough around the edges perhaps uh, maybe he was in the seventies. Um, I, I heard that he was a little, little um, tougher back then. But um, I think he's, I think he's at a, as far as the band. I think he's at a good place with it because I think it's, it's where it sounds and feels like what he wants. So I think that puts him in a good mood. Yeah, yeah. Now, now with uh, Neil Carter back in the band, um, re replacing a. Uh, Paul Raymond, uh, how have the dynamics of the band changed with Neil in the band? Well, Neil is more of a guitar player in my eyes, even though he's a great keyboardist, also and a great musician. Um, 
I think the rhythms are a little chunkier and more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So I think it gives it, it, it like it points the needle a little bit more towards the guitar side and a little more away from the keyboard side. Because I think Neil, that's I think guitar is is more of a strength, and I like that because it makes us meaner and heavier, yeah, and chunkier. Not that it wasn't great before, right? But it's, it's just, just a little. Different. It's always going to, even if you come, you say, "Hey, can you play these parts?" And someone come in and play them. It's it's that's the nature of being in a real live band that doesn't use backup tracks, you know. Everyone is different. Every human being is different. Every musician plays a little differently. So even if you say, we want it to be exactly like this, which I don't think anyone said, but, you know, like, here's the live videos, learn this stuff, you know, it, it's never going to be exact same. And you know, it's always going to change a little bit. And it's interesting to see how it changes. And uh, that's my take on how, how it has changed. Yeah. And uh, I like it a lot. Because I'm a guitar guy, you know, I'm into guitar sounds and guitar music. Yeah, and, and, and watching uh, some of these live videos that UFO has performed recently, um, it seems like Neil really has a lot of energy on stage. And yeah, he's more of a performer than Paul. So yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's he's all over the stage, absolutely. Yeah, one of the things I've always wondered about UFO during the last decade or so is, you know, they're so well respected by so many bands. But yet, you never see them go out on like this major arena tour as a support to one of these major bands. Is it because Phil doesn't want to do that, or is it just because there aren't those opportunities? Which I would find that would be difficult to believe. Yeah, no, we've had we've had offers definitely, and uh, we went out with Priest in Europe um, just not that long ago, three years ago or something, maybe four. That was that was great, um, and and we. And everyone enjoyed it a lot. Phil enjoyed it, but I think um, I think the offer just has to be sweet enough, you know. Yeah, I think that's the, that's that's the case. Right now, now UFO toured in the beginning of uh, 2020. Um, are there plans for 2021? Tentative plans, or where do we stand as far as UFO going out on the road again at this point? Yeah, there's there's a bunch of things on the website. I'm going to pull it up and look right now as I'm talking, okay? Sure. Let's see. What I, mean, I, th I thought I saw some some 2021, but I just thought, you know, is it are those really dates that are confirmed, or is it just... Well, they, they are confirmed, but no one really knows, um, you know, what's going to happen, because... Right. yeah. Yeah. With COVID, it's just, it's all conjecture. But we have July um, in Spain and Germany. We have October in Greece, Holland and Germany and Czech Republic. This is 2021, of course. You're right. And um, there are some, let me see, South, South America's, April, May, twenty one. So those dates aren't up yet, but yeah, it, it doesn't give you uh, much much uh, wiggle room uh, with spread eagle dates, now does it? Uh, you know, I'll work it out. Yeah, I'll work it out. I always do. No, it's it's you know, I wish I was, you know, I wish I wish I was always <laughs> touring, you know. Um, I mean, I, I enjoy I enjoy being home too. Don't get me wrong, but I like working and I like playing. Yeah. Uh, so there's um um I could I could work a lot more than I do. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about a normal year. You know, there's there's many months I'm home. So uh, so there's always room. Do you think there's any uh, possibility that we will see a new UFO record before it's over? I hope so. It's hard to say. I haven't heard anything about about it, but I would love to be part of another UFO album. And uh, you never know. I mean, it's it's it's. I think it's back to back to you know the offer has to be right. Like with there's bands like Spread Eagle that that need to make records because 
you know, for one thing, it's creatively, you know, we, we need to uh, just for ourselves, but also we need to keep getting our name out there and making a, a story for us and, and, and making our story more deep and more, you know, more to it, you know, and, uh, and it gives, gives us a chance to tour and a chance to do interviews and things like that, which we can talk about the tours and stuff like that. So it all kind of feeds into that whole snowball momentum thing. But, but UFO, you know, they're towards the end of their career and they don't really need to make records to go out on tour. No. And everyone knows that band, most bands, you know, a lot of bands lose money making records. I mean, there's, there's, there's so little profit to be made. Um, and that's, you know, that's what big, some bigger bands too, you know? So I don't know. I hope, I hope we do. And I think it would be a great record if we do, we, you know, we'd have now have Neil, uh, involved, you know, in it and involved in the writing and the playing, uh, along with Vinny and I and, and the other guys. And so, um, so I hope so, but, yeah. um, you know, it, it would have to be a, they would have to have a good reason to do it. Like, I think, you know, they, I think to go, to put all that time into something and, and, you know, you, you need to get certain things back from it. Yeah. Well, Phil seems like such a natural writer that it would be hard to believe that he doesn't have just like tons of material pouring Probably out of does. him. Probably does, you know? And I think, uh, you know, I, I hope it happens. I really do. Yeah. I think it, I think he's got some great stuff still inside him. All right. Well, Rob, let's end, let's end the interview with uh, the last question of, at this point in your career, what do you think the highlight has been so far? I would say writing on UFO's album, A Conspiracy of Stars, which I believe was around 2016-ish. Um, and touring with Sebastian Bach as direct support for Guns N' Roses in general, but probably South America was, was the highlight um, of that, of those shows. And releasing Spread Eagle Subway to the Stars after all these years. Those are the three highlights for me. Yeah, definitely three good ones. And, produce, and producing it. Yeah. Well, Rob, I just want to thank you very much again for your time. Um, great interview. It was nice hearing about uh, two amazing bands and Sebastian Bach and it was very nice talking thank you again thank you Tom this concludes our interview with Rob DeLuca for more on Rob DeLuca please visit spreadeagle.us for more episodes of the glam metal interview series please visit glammetal.com and rockmusicstar.com and a special thanks to Eric Romer for providing us with our kick-ass theme music.